I think we've got to understand what this is about, and I'm coming from it from our professional point of view as a membership organisation. So uh, that's where you have to take this. But I'm also coming from it also from the patient's point of view as well, I hope. This is all about individual outcomes. Uh, it's not team outcomes, it's not unit outcomes. I think that's very, very important to point this out, as has been demonstrated. So I'm at a meeting... Uh, Bruce always likes to give little stories. I was at a meeting of the Academy of Royal Colleges and Bruce whispers in my ear, I'd like a chat with you, Norman, after the meeting. Always a worrying remark. when I. So he sidles up to me after this meeting uh, and he says, right, Norman, he says, I think we should be publishing individual surgeons' outcomes in a variety of of specialties and he pulls out a dirty little envelope which is written about uh, five or six special what do you think about this Norman I think Bruce this is a good idea I said and God I when I got home and thought about that I thought well I wonder what I've said but it is a good idea and it remains a good idea and why does it remain a good idea? First of all, I'd just like to also say that I have great admiration for the cardiac surgeons who set this all off from about, I think, 90, 2005, if I recall, something like that. So they have set the standards in this country. So for us, it's all about using audits because what Bruce was saying earlier, we think that's a better way of doing it. It's more accurate than HES data, although HES data is improving. And um, what we're doing is to publish individual outcomes, of course, in nine surgical and one medical cardiology specialty. And there's the list. And that covers 20 procedures in nine surgical specialties. So you've got the list there. You're familiar, probably some of you are familiar uh, with that. The specialty associations have really risen to this challenge, and I've been enormously proud of our profession during this. <clears throat> and, of course, there are dissenters, but the majority have been on board on this. The... Specialty associations will host the information on the website and the college will be hosting a generic patient information with links to the specialty information and NHS choices uh, will link to the college and association websites. Our position is this very clear. We believe in transparency. We think it empowers patients, as has just been said by Phil. There is strong evidence that publishing outcome data, individual outcome data, does improve care. We've seen that with the cardiac surgeon. No doubt Ben will, will uh, wax lyrical on that subject, but we've seen that. But it's not just in cardiac surgery. We've seen it also in trauma and orthopedics. We've seen it in vascular surgery. <clears throat> and we're seeing it in other specialties. And that's a very important point to make. And we welcome this focus, actually, on surgical outcomes as a means to improve the data collection because we believe that we'll enhance the audits, which are very, very important. And they're not, they're not as good, some of them, as we would like. And also, of course, this will be a, a link to revalidation as well because there's no way anymore, that, and it's not just surgeons, and I'll come to that later, but for surgeons, it's, they will all have to collect their own data. It'll all be audited very carefully anyway, because they will need that for their revalidation. So it's, a, it's one of a piece, and, and you can't run away from this. And I'm delighted to say I don't believe our specialty uh, is doing that. So we want to report the percent of patients having surgery, what their outcomes will, will be, but... And there are some provisos, of course there are. And as I said, we're a membership organisation. I have to present the other side of it as well. And I've got to present really what the concerns have been so that people understand where we're coming from. So we need the figures to be comparable. We need the outcome risk adjusted to account for the severity of the disease and other patient uh, uh, factors. I operated before I became present for eight hours on a patient with Crohn's disease who'd had six previous operations. 
You can't compare that sort of case with a patient who's having an operation for Crohn's disease for the first time. It would be wrong to compare my data, if I'm doing lots and lots of those cases, of course, with the guy uh, who's doing the simple straightforward case. It would be totally wrong to do that. So we've got to ensure that the data quality is complete and accurate, we've got comparable figures, and robustly risk-adjusted. Now, you'll see, I'm sure Ben will be producing these funnel plots. This is the way that this sort of data is presented. And it's important. So basically, don't worry. These, are, these dots, although they represent units, you can actually say they represent individuals. And this is actual data, actually. But, um, so you will notice that here, where people are performing uh, fewer numbers of procedures, you get tremendous variation. But that can be random variation. So you only need, uh, if a person is doing, say, 25, 30 of the particular cases, you only need one death and you get, you know, quite a high mortality. <laughs> the more you do, and this is very important, the better you get at it, and the data tightens, okay? So, and that's very important anyway about, for other reasons like centralization of, uh, of work. So these guys are performing very well, they're doing large numbers of cases, and the mortality is very, you know, pretty good, reasonably low. Now, this guy, you know, these are confidence limits. This guy is, could be a worry. They're not quite outside the range of, the, uh, <coughs> of, of this uh, uh, confidence limit, but they could be. So, and you could have somebody up here, of course, and that's an outlier. And an outlier can be an outlier for all sorts of reasons. It could be that the data's wrong. It could be that the risk adjustment isn't accurate. It could be he or she is doing an innovative procedure, and we want people, providing they're properly controlled, to carry on with innovation. So there are maybe very cogent reasons for an outlier, and we've got to be absolutely sure that that person is an outlier if we're going to name and shame them, which we can talk about during question time. But that outlier may not be a true outlier, and we've got to recognize that. We do not want headlines like this. And this is what I think, I don't know, there aren't any media people in the room, but <clears throat> I'm pleading with the media, and we've had some dialogue with the media, not to sensationalize this. Now, there will always be newspapers that will do this. There's no question about it. But I think the responsible guys in the broadsheets who really comment on this sort of stuff are starting to get it. Uh, that this will not help anybody. It will not help patients, and it certainly will not help the profession deal with those particular problems. We need to deal with the outliers, which we do anyway to a certain extent, and we need to support them and get them better. Because it may not be, if they are true outliers or true poor performance, that the whole of their practice is poor. It may be that they're doing something that they probably shouldn't be doing and we need to stop them from doing that and get them back into doing what they may be uh, pretty reasonable at. Not all surgeons are members of specialist associations and that's a point in all of this and a problem for, for us. Not all surgeons' work is captured in these audits. Uh, that's another important point. So if you're going to publish the names of people uh, that haven't consented, you have to realize there may be people that are not actually in the audits and names shouldn't be out there. And you've also got to realize that what we'll be publishing is a snapshot of individuals' practice. So, for instance, in my own field of colorectal disease, cancer, I know that there is a very well-known surgeon who, over two years, mortality doesn't look so great. But over a 15-year period of practice, his mortality is very low. He's just had a bad two years, you might say, or has dealt with certain problems. So I think that's got to be taken into consideration. And none of these audits were set up for the purpose of measuring individual performance. So, and Bruce has alluded to, there's a variation in the quality of the audits, and there isn't mandatory input. There will be in due course, but there isn't at the moment, and that's another factor. You, and cardiac is one area which it's, I, Ben may disagree with this, but it's easier to measure because people live and die. But in 
uh, trauma in orthopedics is slightly different because not many people die, thank goodness, certainly not uh, in elective orthopedics. But what's important is whether you can walk after a hip operation. You'd agree with me there, I'm sure. Um, so I think that's important. So we've got to get these quality of life measures a lot better than they are now, and we will do that in due course. And I talked about outliers, and I think for the managers in the room, the CEOs and all the medical directors, it's important to actually understand this business, that they may not all be, and I don't think there are going to be too many of them actually, because as Phil was saying, the quality of surgery in this country is remarkably good, as our data actually is showing. <clears throat> but parts of their practice may not be satisfactory. They're going to need a lot of support when their names are come out. Uh, and some of them have been brave enough actually to accept that their names will be in the public uh, uh, arena. And, you know, this is going to have major effects on some people's uh, prof uh, professional careers. And you've got to, of course, balance this. Are they, can we remediate them? Can we remediate the true outliers? And uh, can we, um, and of course, we've got to protect the public. So that's got to be taken into them. Now, Bruce touched on consent. There are all issues about consent. Uh, perhaps I'll let um, um, Ben talk about that uh, a bit more. But we are, as a college, encouraging all our surgeons uh, to opt in. And the, the results so far, I haven't got the exact uh, number, but I think we've got 2,800 of the 4,000 surgeons who've responded, of which approximately 96% have consented, which I think is fantastic, actually. You know, I really do think that is fantastic. So there are a small number that haven't consented, but I still think it's wrong to name and shame the individuals without giving them a chance of that explanation. Why are they not consenting? Now, some of them I know, and it probably two-thirds at least I know, are very concerned about the data. They don't believe it's accurate. They don't believe the denominator's right, etc., etc. And we should give them a chance to look at that data, make sure that they're happy with it, and even if it means delaying their publication. Um, I think that's fair, and I think that's appropriate, and I think, it'll, the, I think the public will understand that. And there is a legal risk, actually, in misidentifying people who are outliers. If you, are, if you uh, name and shame somebody who isn't a really true outlier, he or she could ruin, it could ruin their professional careers, and they'd have every right to sue you. And I would support them in that if, in fact, it is a wrong identification. So it's important that our surgical profession leads this work. And uh, we work very well with... Uh, he's a surgeon, after all. Um, and so we're working well uh, with uh, NHS England and with HQIP, who are running this, uh, as Ben is uh, helping with that. And I think it's a real opportunity to show lead leadership and demonstrate our commitment to the public about transparency, accountability. And I think at the end of the day, and I hope and I believe that it will improve patient care. And finally, I'd just like to say, uh, and I do apologize to Winston Churchill, it's not the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, but it's perhaps the beginning of the beginning. This is a process that will go on improving and improving and I don't think we'll be in a really good position to about five years when we've refined it. But I think we have to start somewhere. Uh, and what I am actually saying and throwing down the gauntlet to the rest of the medical profession, um, that uh, they should step up to the plate. I think uh, it'd be very interesting to see how GPs are individually performing, how psychiatrists are, how diabetologists are. I'd like to see their response to this, but I think we're leading, we're proud to do so, and we think the rest of the profession should do the same. Thank you very much.